What is up everybody? Joe Everest, the fence expert, coming to you with an exciting new series diving into the world of temporary fencing because I read all the social media posts, I see the conversations that go on. I also talk with you guys at regional meetings and conferences, AFA Midwest meetings and such. And temporary fencing seems to be a pretty consistent uh, topic of discussion. Both contractors wanting to get into temporary fencing as well as an established contractors wanting to scale up their temporary fencing. So I thought, what better way to dive into this discussion than creating a series talking about the wild world of temporary fencing. Guys, before we dig into it, I wanna give a huge shout out to Sanko Safety Marketplace, who's making this series happen. Sanko is your one-stop shop for everything temporary fencing. Six foot, eight foot tall panels, no problem. 10 or 12 foot wide panels? You bet, they've got it. They've got chain link mesh covered panels, they've got welded wire panels, they've got the feet, the wind braces, all the accessories you could ever want to start a temporary fencing division of your company. Or, like we do, replenish stock over time. Thank you so much, Sanko, for making this possible. And also, Sanko's saying thank you to you for watching this channel by offering a discount code of JOE10 at checkout. There's a link below to the Sanko Marketplace. Enter JOE10 at checkout to save 10% off your next order. All right, guys, the first episode in this series is basically just why would you want to get into temporary fencing? Well, for me, the big reason was revenue, not just additional revenue. That's great. We'll talk about that in a minute. But also diversification of revenue. If we look at, at least in the Midwest, the seasonality of fencing, we do both residential and commercial at Ozark Fence. Both of those are a bit seasonal. Now, residential seems to be the most affected by seasonality, whether it's people think that we're not building fence because it's cold, or maybe we're getting into a rainy season. People just aren't interested in building residential fencing during the winter. Now, commercial fencing, that's not as a affected. Commercial projects typically go on year round, but there is some still variability and seasonality to it. So when we were evaluating whether to offer temporary fencing for our business, that's really what did it for us was not only is it additional revenue, but also we can diversify the revenue streams that are coming into Ozark Fence. Now, in addition to diversifying the revenue, one nice thing about temporary fencing is that we could offer it without really scaling up our overhead as much as we're scaling up our revenue. It's not necessarily a one-to-one. -one. We already had a location. You know, to get started in temporary fencing, you really probably only need an area that's 20 foot by 30 foot. More area is great, but if you're really efficient at stacking and keeping everything nice and neat, I think you could get by with the 20 by 30 area to lay down fence panels Panels, feet, sandbags, or weighted feet, whatever, however it is you decide it's best for you. It doesn't take that much extra space. We already had the space. It also doesn't take additional staff to do it, additional team members. We pull typically from either our installation team members, whether it be residential or commercial, or our shop team members here, the support personnel here on site, depending on the day and who's on what project, we can really pull from whichever bucket of team members we have to go out and install these fencing panels. So we're able to start bringing in, as we said, diversified revenue, recurring revenue, we'll talk about that in a little bit as well, without a lot of additional resources. Like I said, we had the space, we had the team members. It was really just adding that service. Now there is training that goes along with it. In episodes to come, we'll talk about processes, systems, checklists, that sort of thing. You do need some foundational just infrastructure as far as systems and processes, but you don't need a lot of additional resources to bring in this revenue. Now, while it may not require a lot of additional resources, as we already talked about, it does require some, a little bit of space. You will need team members to set it up or yourself and helpers, depending on how you're set up. You'll also need to look at your insurance coverage because you're getting into the world of commercial fencing. And a lot of times commercial contractors and commercial customers themselves require their contractors to hold a certain minimum level of insurance. Now, depending on your insurance agent or brokerage and how you set up your insurance program, you may already have these minimum requirements, but it's important to have a conversation with them and also likely a couple general contractors in your area to get really familiar with the minimum requirements for insurance. Relay those back to your insurance agent or brokerage. You will need a minimum level of insurance to get onto the jobs, both in general liability, typically also automobile, as well as workman's compensation 
compensation coverage. One thing you likely don't have yet, if you haven't gotten into the world of commercial fencing through temporary fencing or otherwise, is OSHA training. So typically most commercial job sites are gonna require a minimum of an OSHA 10 hour program, at least here in our area. So just as a standard procedure, when we bring on a team member that we know is going to go into the commercial side, whether it's temporary fencing or permanent fencing installations, we just run them through an OSHA 10 hour course. Now in our area, there's a few local providers that do that. It's a great service. I believe there's also probably some online courses in today's day and age that offer that as well, but plan for that additional expense of having yourself, your team members qualify for a minimum of the OSHA 10 hour certification. There are projects that will require a 40 hour certification or above, or maybe some specialized certification, depending on if you're going to be in a confined area, or if you're going to be working around flammable objects, uh, combustibles, there's some specific requirements sometimes, but at a minimum, plan on obtaining an OSHA 10 hour certification for yourself and the team members that are gonna be providing the temporary fencing solutions. All right, the overarching theme here so far though is we've got diversified revenue, increased revenues without a lot of extra overhead. There will be some, I'm not saying it's free money, never is, but the overhead doesn't keep pace with the additional revenue. You'll need some, but not as much as the rest of your business. If we increase the revenue, only slightly increase the overhead, that means ideally more of that revenue ends up at the bottom line, the net profit for your business, which is for us the reason we got into temporary fencing. Not a lot of extra overhead required, not a lot of extra team members, processes, not a lot of extra equipment needed, but we could have a serious impact on our bottom line, the net profit of our business. All right, guys, if you're having trouble keeping up with your notes or maybe the notes are hard to understand, absolutely no worries. Sanko has put together some downloadable content to go over this content as a whole. So a cheat sheet, if you will, or maybe like Cliff Notes versions of this topic. Check out the link in the description for the downloadable content. The third benefit or thing to consider when you're getting into offering or when you're considering offering temporary fencing is that it's a pretty easy upsell. If you're already doing commercial work, it's as easy as saying to that commercial client or general contractor, hey, did you know that we also offer temporary fencing? If it's a general contractor, it's as easy as asking them to put you under the category for temporary site fencing so that when a plan has it in it, you automatically get notified to include that as a separate line item in your proposal. Increasingly, commercial sites are being required to have temporary fencing, whether it's by their insurance company or local regulations. A minimum of a secured laydown area is typical, but what we're seeing in our area is the entire perimeter needs to be secured, at least during the majority of the initial phases of construction. We typically are called back out to remove it after walls are up and everything's roughed in. The insurance companies are typically comfortable once it's got windows and doors that can be locked, that temporary fencing comes down. But what we found is more and more customers are requesting to have temporary fencing because their job sites are required to have some level of temporary fencing. The demand is out there. And if you're already doing commercial fence, it's pretty easy to get into. Now, if you're not already offering commercial fencing as a service or as part of your business, temporary fencing could be a great way to tiptoe into the commercial market. It's as literally as easy as reaching out to general contractors and letting them know that you meet the general insurance requirements because you've done your homework. You have your OSHA certifications because you know in your region that these are required, whether it's 10 hour, 40 hour, etc., and that you've got the manpower and the products ready to secure lay down areas or sites. Sometimes you can give them specifics of, I can cover projects up to this size. Largely, that doesn't matter. If you just ask to be put on the bid list for temporary site security, then next time a bid comes up, you'll get an email. Typically it's an email with with a link to a Google Drive or a Dropbox or a bidding software to where you can do your, all your takeoffs, come up with a proposal for the temporary fencing. We'll get into figuring out your numbers later on and submit your bid package. You can also notate that you're not gonna bid that particular project, but that you'd like to bid projects in the future. Say if you're just getting into this and it's a perimeter that's several thousand feet and you're just not ready for that kind of investment for one project, you simply decline to bid, but let them know that you'd be happy to bid projects in the future. You can realistically decide which projects you want to get involved with and let the contractors know if you so choose you're willing to bid smaller projects or you're willing to bid closer projects whatever the reason most of general contractors right now 
are just thrilled that you're willing to consider bidding on the projects. A lot of the projects we get right now, we are the bidder on. I have a feeling in your neck of the woods, depending on area, of course, you might be the same way. It's really easy to get into simply by reaching out to general contractors and letting them know that you're qualified and you're ready to offer temporary site security. In this same vein of tiptoeing into commercial fencing, once you've got several of these projects under your belt and you're wanting to maybe grow a little bit more into commercial fencing, talking to those same general contractors and letting them know, hey, please also put me down for the permanent fencing structures. Again, you can pick through and cherry pick the ones that you're wanting to bid on. Maybe you're wanting to go from site security into dumpster enclosures or privacy screening, whatever your comfort level is. You don't necessarily have to jump straight into 10,000 foot projects that have a lot of automation. You can communicate with these general contractors and let them know, hey, if you see something that has smaller work on it, I would love to bid it, or else just send me what you have and I'll let you know if I'm a good fit for that. But as I said before, offering temporary fencing is a great way to tiptoe into the commercial market. It's easy to get involved with. It doesn't take a lot of extra specialized equipment. So a lot of times getting into commercial means upgrading into maybe full side skid steers. If you're just in residential, you likely have a mini skid or some other smaller piece of equipment. Getting into commercial typically means you also upgrade all of your equipment. Temporary fencing is a nice half measure. It does require a truck and a trailer. Some equipment makes it nice to move around weighted feet if that's something you're offering. But as I've said all along, this is a great way to get into commercial fencing without really outlaying a lot of capital and resources. Now, we've spent a lot of time talking about how this is good for you, the contractor. I mean, ultimately, it needs to make sense on your end, but this is also good for the client. Whether you're working directly for commercial clients or working through a general contractor, they both tend to want to deal with as few vendors as possible. Ideally, the reason commercial clients go with general contractors typically is they don't want to manage the project. They want one point of contact to deal with for either the construction or the remodeling or the expansion of their project. The general contractor contractors are much the same. If they can deal with as few contractors as possible, they'll do that. So the general contractors will often wait bid submissions with that thought in mind to where if they have three different contractors, one offering temporary fencing or just temporary site services, one offering some of the permanent fence but not others, and then a third offering whatever remainder, or they have one bidder that offers all three services, typically they'll give weight to the one bidder that covers all three services. Now, your experience may vary. This may not apply to every contractor, or every general contractor in the States, but in our experience, it does weigh pretty heavily with the contractors in our neck of the woods. And not just your own contractors, as I said, commercial clients also want to deal with as few contractors. If you can be the one professional that they can deal with to do both the temporary site security, the temporary services, as well as the permanent fencing, the permanent structures, they will love you for it. As long as you handle it in, like I said, a professional manner, it takes that additional load off of their plate. It's one less bill to enter, it's one less contractor to deal with, it's one less avenue of communication, it's one less check to cut, hopefully, when the project is completed. So not only is offering temporary fencing good for you and your bottom line as a contractor, it's also a great service to offer to both commercial clients and the commercial general contractors that serve these commercial clients. So in this first episode, we've evaluated how offering temporary fencing could be a great option for your contracting company because it diversifies revenue without adding a lot of overhead. It will add overhead. I don't want to be taken as saying it is free money, but not much overhead. It's easy to get into whether or not you're currently offering commercial fencing, and it's also a great experience for the customer. But overall, at the day's end, we always or we should begin with the end in mind with our business. The end in mind is one day we may may sell this thing or we may sell it to our children or pass it down. Regardless, however it gets done, what we should be concerned with is a proper business valuation. Offering recurring revenue is a great way to increase the multiple of the valuation of your business. You see, recurring revenue is typically valued higher than single transaction revenue. Even if single transaction revenue happens consistently with repeat customers, it's still typically viewed 
at a lower multiple. Don't hear that just because you add recurring revenue, you double the value of your business. It's not that great. And it does require work, but recurring revenue with repeatable systems and processes will increase the overall value of your business. To go over these different types of uh, processes and systems, stay tuned for additional pieces of content coming your way in the future. For now, Joe Everest, the fence expert, reminding you that good fences make good neighbors, and I'll see you next time.